is This Thing On follows 10 students at the School of Hard Knock Knocks as they embark on a journey to become Australia's latest comedy sensation. Oh, mate, that was just hilarious. No, this is tough. Took sleeping pill, forgot to set the alarm. Yeah. I'm going to make it a goal that I will be on stage here one day. It took me back a little bit, you know, and I put so much pressure on myself. Oh, can we, can I have a second? Over six emotionally charged episodes, Glyn Nicholas and six of Australia's most accomplished comedians guide the students through a range of master classes and comedy related excursions, providing them with the basic skills they'll need to perform in front of a live audience. For some, the experience will be unbearable. For others, euphoric. It's day one. The students have assembled at the Imperial Hotel on Melbourne's Chapel Street in a back room that will be their classroom and rehearsal space for the next six days. This is the first time the students have met and each of them has been told to prepare a two minute routine to present to the class. The room is thick with anticipation and nervous energy. It's Glyn's job to harness the enthusiasm and set the agenda. My name is Glyn, G-L-Y-N-N. If you call me Glenn, I will kill you. I'm currently living in Adelaide. I really enjoy doing the tango. I'm Judy. I'm from Keelor and I like computer games. My name's Grant. I'm from Melbourne. I enjoy sailing. I'm Stacey. I'm from Sydney. Grew up in Melbourne though. Frankston. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm Steve from Melton and I enjoy uh, football. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, Ten. Hey, oh, we did it. That's all right. That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, take a seat. Well done. When people are laughing, there's, we, we open ourselves up, don't we? It's almost a spiritual thing. I often talk about the stage being a sort of a sacred space in a funny kind of way because it is special. What we're going to just try and do this week is just to sort of make you more comfortable being in that place and being able to tell your story or your your anecdotes or whatever it is. Glyn's natural ease and gentle nature soon has everyone focused and feeling comfortable within the space. It's now time to meet their first instructor, behavioural psychologist, Steve Van Apron. Our body language displays a lot about what we're thinking and what we're feeling. The biggest thing that prevents us from achieving great success is our own feelings or attitudes or fears. My job or my role over the next few days is to help you combat those type of fears or concerns. Our brain monitors all our negative self-talk. If we think we're bad at something, we're going to be bad at something. I want you guys to absolutely blitz when you're on stage. You know the biggest fear that people have in life? Public speaking. They, they feel that they're going to be judged. And you know what? Guess what? People judge us on a daily basis. Don't let that inhibit you. I have yet to see a statue erected in honour of a critic. <laughs> That's a very good thing to finish on. Thank you for that, Steve. My Get pleasure. Of course, thank you, Steve. Thank you. But I think now might be a good time for us to get ready uh, to do our little moments up on stage. I actually have got a, someone I want to introduce to you. He's a good mate and he's a fantastic comedian. Would you all please welcome to this seat here, Brad Oakes. Brad. Brad Oakes is one of Australia's leading comics, having worked as a stand-up for over 30 years. Not only has he found success performing in pubs, comedy clubs and on numerous TV shows across the nation, he's also renowned for his analytical mentoring skills in helping comedians get the best out of their material. He is the comedian's comedian, and today he'll be giving the students the wisdom of his experience in the art of writing and telling jokes. I'm a member of a coincidence club, right? We, we don't meet, we just run into each other and go, fuck. <laughs> Brad and I have actually worked together. He's worked on material. I've submitted material and I said, can you make this funny? <laughs> Please. <Good> so, <laughs> a good... A good <laughs> I'm not quite as nice as Glyn. Uh, so don't take offence if uh, I say anything that you feel is negative. I'm just trying to short circuit any bad habits. The thing about Brad is that it comes from a good place. You know you're going to get critics and you can tell by the way of their, their language. It's such that... a bad <laughs> recommendation. And just look, we're really sorry, but he, he pisses himself a little bit. Now. Hands up if you've got your two minutes. Everyone's got something. And how are we all feeling about it? Nervous. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? I'd be nervous if anyone wasn't nervous. If, if it was easy, everyone would do it, you know. And I'm sure you've all met people who think that they're funny 
but get them up on stage for two minutes and see how funny they are then. Have you ever had a conversation with someone and you say, I'm nervous, and they say, I'm nervous too, and then it becomes kind of a competition? My name is Lee, and yes, I'm an Asian person. You know, they're I get punched in the face a lot. Tinder? I got dumped. Pulled the ripcord and nothing happened. Because back in my younger days, when I was religious, I actually started training to be an Anglican priest. Happily married, I'm in a same-sex marriage. My wife and I have been having the same fucking sex for 22 <laughs> years. So guess who's first Kim to cruise? <laughs> I get a buzz when I get on stage. A lot like a heroin addict would get a buzz from taking drugs. I'm a Frankston girl. I was five when I had my first cigarette. <laughs> On my 17th birthday, uh, my mum came up to me and uh, she had her glass of cask wine in her hand. And she said to me, she said, son? <laughs> I actually felt terrible, to be honest with you. And it, I, I don't know what happened, but I felt that my, the back of my neck got all stiff and then I started to seize and I couldn't lift my head up. What I noticed about Kim, uh, she engaged in what I call the head drop. Head drop is usually when somebody may lack a bit of confidence and sometimes I'll also look for hand to face masking, concealment or blocking behaviours. When you drop your head, you drop your eyes yes, as well. Yeah. When you drop your eyes and you break eye contact with the audience, you don't need to be looking at them, but they need to see that your eye, eyes are projecting out into the room, then their listening turns down. You can ameliorate that by holding your head up. It will feel unnatural, but you're doing an unnatural thing anyway. From my own personal experience, I, um, I didn't feel like I did very well at all. And then the guy that you do like walks in and you say, how are you? I just farted. I don't know why I said that, I love you. <laughs> I was really nervous because I tried to underprepare so that I didn't overthink it. But then the minute I got on stage, I was like, I haven't prepared. I'm not ready to do this, I regret it. When you get the feedback afterwards, how many people are like, God, you look so comfortable and so relaxed. Meanwhile, on stage, I was shaking. I lost a little bit of my hearing. Have you ever been so nervous? Your ears go ee. <laughs> there is a, a condition in stand-up, which is don't be more interesting than you set. If I came out in that suit, I'd probably be just turning inside out with um, concern about whether, whether or not it works. This is me. This I'm is, probably yeah. toned down, actually. I just wanted to gauge how... But yeah, yeah, this is me. <laughs> yeah, this is yeah. this is my my toned no, down not, day. <laughs> and it totally works for me. But yeah. I, uh, my point is, people form an opinion of you before you speak. Mm -hmm. So you still want to be commensurate with how you want to come across. You don't want to uh, walk out and look vivacious and then come out and and be incredibly meek. You know, you can either fall on the floor and and fall to pieces, or you can just grab it and. You know, make, make as much as you can from it, and that's what I'm doing. I got dumped. Oh. Yeah, brutally. I got dumped by my fiance of three years. She also chucked in that um, I'm angry, I'm joyless, and I have an inappropriate, immature sense of humour. And it's like, not everyone can be German. It's, you know, what can you do? I want to work, in particular with Brad, on his uh, negative self-talk. It's like, you know, your, your brain eavesdrops into all the negative self-talk. And I think, I want to eliminate that. I really want to get that out of his system because I think he is very funny and he is self-deprecating and I think he has great presence, but he's got to get over those nerves. Those nerves are holding him back. Comedy is transmitting ideas. If we rush through those ideas too quickly, we miss stuff and we don't want to miss it. There is one physical thing you can do if you step back from the microphone or hold the microphone a little bit away and louden your voice, it will slow you down. Because just saying slow down, slow down is like saying don't panic, don't panic. My name's Grant Johnson and I am really happy to be here. Seriously, I am actually really happy to be here. 16 weeks ago I had open heart surgery. If anything happens while I'm up here on stage, I uh, do not wish to be resuscitated unless you're actually really good looking. <laughs> I think it was a little bit of therapy, actually talking about my experience of 16 weeks ago. To do this is, is an opportunity and I think we just put things off way too much because we think we're going to be here forever and I know what it's like to know, look, to know that you might not be here the next day. You wrote this yesterday. 
Yes. Okay. This afternoon. Okay, wow. You've got the best country and western voice. Yeah, right. yeah, if you do nothing else, you should release an album. <laughs> uh, You're very affable on stage. We immediately like you. Mm. That's such a big thing. I mean, I say good being here, it's just good being alive. I did actually uh, email my surgeon and actually ask him, you know, whether he thinks this is a good idea, and he, he thought it's a great idea, he said, go for it. Your microphone technique. We need to let this piece of equipment not be a hindrance. So getting a technique with this microphone for you is yeah. something that I'd like to focus on. I always recommend you go and buy yourself a microphone. You can get them for about a hundred bucks. It doesn't need to work. You just need to be so friendly with it that people can't see it. Many years ago, I had a boyfriend and uh, he suggested that uh, we learn to skydive. Yeah, I was happy with the way it went. I mean, uh, for a first up, I mean, I didn't forget anything, got the laughs where I expected them. On this particular day, though, I jumped out of the plane, pulled the ripcord, and nothing happened. And I went, no, no, there's definitely nothing there. I think I'm gonna die. I want Judy to relax more. I want her to have fun. Uh, she seems very structured, and I'd even go so far as saying very robotic in her delivery. I felt that was an absence of enjoyment. And this can come from over-rehearsing. You should remind yourselves always to go out and enjoy yourself. It doesn't matter how shit scared you are. This is the best fun I've had for most, most of my adult life, is doing this even when it's been crap. I went to the uh, chemist the other day and uh, gave my prescription to the pharmacist and she said, would you like the cheap brand or would you like the expensive brand as they do? And I felt really uncomfortable. So I said, I'll have the cheap brand, but I, I just want you to know, like, financially, I'm doing okay, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I can afford the expensive brand. Okay, let's talk about Steve Mackey without doubt the most nervous in the group. However, I believe that we can actually channel that nervousness into something really good. After a while, I noticed a change, not just in tempo, but it was almost like it was uplifted, and he, he, you could tell he felt comfortable. And all of a sudden, he went back down again. And I'm thinking, bring back the Steve that was up there before. Great material. Don't ever worry about the material. I think there's a real rich vein of, you know, you see the absurdity in life. He is so stressed. He is so nervous. He's so anxious. He's so concerned. There are a lot of things that <laughs> he's going to take a lot of work. So I want you to think about enunciating. You need to enunciate your words more. If I don't understand what you're saying, yeah. I'm gonna call out what, and I'm gonna keep calling out what, so, until I hear you, because it's very, very important. Um, I just wanna sort of, I don't know, like, come out of my shell a bit. Public speaking is, 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 you know, has always been something that uh, I have a fear with, and, and it's always been a challenge. And then it comes to the first time you have sex. And in the movies, it's uh, one minute of sensual lovemaking, followed by cuddles and falling asleep in each other's arms. Reality, it's 30 seconds of the jackhammer technique, followed by lines such as, this doesn't usually happen, and it's just been a really long time. <laughs> and after he finally rolls off you, and you do your dance to the bathroom, that's where you sit and contemplate and reevaluate your life. In fact, I might go and reevaluate it mine now. <laughs> I thought I was going to bomb dramatically. There was, no one was gonna laugh. They were gonna be like, that wasn't comedy. Get off the stage. I also thought that I'd probably run off the stage screaming. I didn't think I'd actually make it through the full two minutes. But yeah, I survived. If something is funny and it doesn't work in terms of what you said, it's generally a contextual fail. You've assumed that somebody knows what you're talking about. Yeah and they don't. And this is absolutely essential that all of you develop this awareness about what people know. It's generally called conventional wisdom. You don't need to know what's true. You need to know what people think is true. In relation to Cara, one of the things I look for is what we call micro-expressions. Now, all human beings, when we experience a feeling, a thought or emotion, will exhibit itself on our face within between 1 25th and 1 100th of a second. Very quick, but if you know what to look for, it's pretty obvious. Now, a couple of times I saw um, concern or stress, and sometimes when people are concerned, it might be something like that. 
just furrowing of the eyebrows and crinkling in the middle of the, the forehead. The other thing about Cara, uh, when it comes to self-deprecating, very easy to relate to. And as humans, we all want to feel connected. We all want to feel comfortable in the presence of other people. And she did that extremely well. When you got your first big laugh, I watched your body relax. Yeah. You can't help it. You get your first laugh. And you go, oh, this is a piece of piss. Yes, it's right. <laughs> it will alleviate some of your nerves. Uh, yes, I am Steve Davis, one of the plainest, most common names you'll hear <laughs> in all your life. There's a lot of people out in the world with your name more successful than you are. <laughs> and in my case, I've got Steve Davis, the international cricket umpire. He's from Adelaide. Uh, Steve Davis, the snooker champion from the UK. Uh, Steve Davis, the gay adult porn star. And I'm not sure where he hangs his hat. But up against all this stiff competition, there's one area in the world of Steve Davis's where I come out on top, and that's Twitter. Because I got there first, and I got the username at Steve Davis. Thank you. Uh, which brings its own problems, because I'm often involved in conversations and people think they're talking to a different Steve Davis. He has confidence in spades, no doubt about it. But I want to slow him down so he can actually enjoy the moment and not feel the need he's got to impress. His material is great. Then I felt like when I got up there, I was at the top of a snow-covered mountain mm. and I just sat in a bobsled and just went <laughs> shoof. You no, know, and one of the hardest things to learn ever in stand-up comedy is to leave a space for the laugh. A journalist from the UK tweeted me. He said, hey, Steve Davis, we're doing a feature on snooker. Uh, you've been playing it for years. Why do you keep doing it? So I tweeted back to him, hey, Tom, thanks for the question. I keep playing snooker because there's nothing I like better than bending over a pool table and sinking the pink. Stand-up is just this dark space that is... It's like the early maps of Australia where the whole bottom southern half was just sort of nothing. No one knew what the map... what was there. Well, I think you weren't listening as much. When we do comedy, we must have good yeah. ears. I always say, grow your ears. Yeah. And I say, listen with your eyes. I hate it when we disagree. Don't ever, ever contradict me. No, I said that. <laughs> I, I, I can tell quite often by people's body language how much they're listening. You can tell when somebody's reading their computer rather than listening to you. You can tell uh, when people go, oh, just move on. I will. <laughs> <laughs> I've recently been on holidays with my blonde German girlfriend, so we had a, a picture together which I put up as my profile shot, and guess what? That comes straight into your Tinder. So my first match said, which one are you? <laughs> I said, which one would you like me to be? <laughs> After that, I actually got really, really nervous. When normally I would get more relaxed as it goes on, but I actually got more nervous as it goes on. What do you think triggered that? I think it's because I just something flipped and I wasn't sure where I was up to. Well, I guess you're trying to think, well, what is my next line? You know, where am I up to? Did I say that already? And how does that weave to the next thing? And then you've got all this stuff going on in your head. And in the meantime, you're trying to pretend you're just pausing for effect. It was obvious to the audience that she was really having problems recalling information or part of the, you know, the jokes and lines and stuff like that. I want her to not focus so much on delivering so much content. I want to chunk it. And what I mean by chunk it, it's easy to remember smaller pieces than huge monologues. My dad, he does a lot of DIY exercise equipment. So every time I visit, He's um, showing me these new things. He showed me one just the other week where you put a little strap on the top of your head and then you just work out your neck. <laughs> My dad, why do you have that? And then he goes, check this out. Flexes his neck and it's thick. I'm like, why would you need that? Grabs a butter knife from the table and just stabs himself in the neck. Just full proper. So, I'm like, so you can do that too, son. Like, great, so next time I have jam and crumpets, then I'm not going to be messed with by anybody. <laughs> the thing I want to work with Lee on, he has great delivery, he has great ability, he's very funny and engaging. What's letting Lee down is the fact that he is actually uh, talking himself down when he should be talking himself up. What I'd like you to do is to focus on the newer material as well. We can get very comfortable doing the same material all the time and that kind of diminishes the muscle that you need of creating the material. After taking to the stage to bravely display their wares, a collective sigh of relief settles over the room. 
this is a diverse group with varying levels of competency and skill, but it was becoming clear to all of them just how daunting the next six days would be. Comedians tend to be very observant. They tend to notice what's different. People say, well, where do you get your ideas? Uh, you know, and what if I run out of material? You'll never run out of material. You're born creative. Brad and Glynn spoke candidly to each performer, offering years of wisdom and advice, and the students hung on every word. There's always the risk of someone getting offended. If you're not potentially offending someone, I don't think it can be funny. Because people won't laugh through their filter. And you can make a joke about every single football team in the AFL until you get to that person's team. And you say, oh, Frank Collingwood, and go, wait a minute, all right, pull up. <laughs> <laughs> pull up yeah. With so much to learn in such a short space of time, Brad decided to focus on improving their material. He split the students into groups and worked together, analysing their routines and helping them to better understand basic joke construction. There should not be anything in a joke it doesn't need to be there. That's why I recommend that you write your jokes down. Don't just try and write them in your head because they are easier to edit. Oh, I was just thinking about his thing with, oh, I really miss the dog. No, 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 originally I said, on one hand, I'm glad all the fights are over, but on the other hand, I really, I really miss the dog. So. Are you, is she the dog? <laughs> no, 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 it's the dog. There's a real dog. You don't write a joke, you hear a joke, and then you have to tell it. That's where you're learning jokes as well. Because you go, oh, that was a beauty. I've got to, I've got to tell you this, I haven't seen it. Oh, that's where you're learning the rhythm. That's where you're learning the structure. So just examine your joke. If it doesn't work and you think it's funny, it probably has a structural or a contextual problem. I can think of something straight away. We've got download, we've got upload. What's another word? Sideways. Sideways, okay. Which is not one of the words, okay. but it's like those words. Yeah, exactly. exactly. What's another word with uh, a hybrid word with load in it? Mother load. Okay. Mother <laughs> sorry, load. my. Sorry. Mother load. So there you, there you, you've done. That's it. still, but that's still computers, isn't it? Oh no, that's no, by the board. That's by the board. Yeah. See, this is where context audience didn't get it. So then what you do is you just go, well, how can we put this into the context of the joke? Yeah. You know? So, you know, I had to upload some stuff. Well, I'm here, I might as well download some porn. And the next thing I know, bang, mother load. Right. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, right, got that, it. That yep. Beautiful. Okay. You should do yeah. this for a living. There's another word with load in it, which is a hybrid word. Okay. What do you do when you get rid of something? Oh, offload. 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 Okay, so you've got download, upload, offload. offload. You know, well, why would I offload? Well, if I didn't have any success with my upload, or I didn't have any success with my download, that would lead to, well... Throwing the computer out the window. OK, this is generally what jokes have in common. They have one of these qualities. Something went wrong, uh, an unfulfilled expectation, a criticism of something, and it's trickery. Uh, I just got back from a surfing safari. I shot four of them. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Now, the trickery inherent in the surfing safari joke is that you focus on surfing, but in fact, I've focused on safari. It had been an intense eight hours of performing, analysis, learning and discovering. But if the students thought they were done for the day, they had another thing coming. As it happened, Brad was emceeing an open mic night at the local pub where some of the tryouts on the bill were fresh out of the School of Hard Knock Knocks. This was the perfect opportunity to give the class a first-hand taste of what to expect in six days and go backstage to an actual comedy venue with a real live audience. No. Oh, yeah. I'm not actually a comedian, I just came here to fix this. Uh, <laughs> uh, good evening, welcome. Welcome here to the local in Port Melbourne. What a fantastic place. In a, a short space of time, when you graduate from the School of Hard Knock Knocks, you're going to be out doing gigs, and I thought, well, why not come and see some people who've already been through that process? You may have noticed something about me straight away. I have a fringe just long enough to say I'm a bit alternative. Um, and probably opinionated, but not short enough to say that I'm a vegan. It would be smart for you to look at uh, the role I'm playing tonight in the show, because even though your focus will be when you go to do stand-up, it will be your spot, you're generally going to be a part of a night. OK, and you should see how you fit in. I've been away, I just got back. I've been on a surfing safari. 
Right? I shot four of them. It's kind of good because later on we went body surfing. Now, oh, you're going to arm me, are you? Okay. Don't get too cocky, I'll stage dive. <laughs> See what happens every time you go, uh, I'm taking off another piece of clothing. I consider that it's conversation that I have with people and I have with their internal monologue. You know the little voice in your head? You know the little voice that just said, what little voice? That little <laughs> voice, that's who I'm trying to speak to. And I'm trying to speak to 100 of them at once. I went out with a girl who, uh, no, I did, I, who, uh, she didn't swear, but I, I could tolerate it, except when it came to sexy talk, because it just got awkward. I want you to take that giant banana and I want you to fudge my cookie into a cream pies. And I just said, you're just making me hungry. <laughs> you can't just learn stand-up comedy by doing it for five minutes a couple of times a week. Essentially, it's a community and it's good to have interaction with people who are in it. Brad then invited the students to mingle with some of the previous alumni from the school who would be performing that night. It was an opportunity to put themselves in the shoes of their peers. In just six days, it would be them on that stage in the spotlight. For Kara, it was a chance to glean some wisdom from a 10 gig veteran over a cold beer. To be honest, what you want to do is, it's not just a joke, it's a, it's a concept that you're having created. You know what I mean? Because when, with comedy for me, it's like fishing. You throw it out there, you listen, you go, nah, that didn't work. You go home, you write it down, you throw it out there again, it didn't work. You know what I mean? Until you get a laugh and you're like, well, that was really good. Uh, look, you guys can probably tell straight away by looking at me, I wear flannelette. Uh, I tend to wear a lot of it. Uh, it's a bit as well, which is crazy. Um, thanks for that. That was great. That was great. No, nah, great, good support, guys. I'm off to six that. Um, <laughs> yeah, if, if your crowd doesn't like it, it doesn't matter. It's your just, you might have 20 jokes. You have five minutes, you pick a couple of jokes, it'll fit. I've performed to 100 people. I performed to two. You tell the joke exactly the same way, with the same timing, you just tell it. I have a tattoo of a rabbit on my chest because from a distance it looks like a hair. So I bought my own hairy chest. Yeah. Thanks. That was a pity clap. I know, that's fine. I think comedy is not just one thing. I think it has to appeal to everybody in the crowd and that everybody might not be at the same time sometimes. So, I've got seven. Is there anybody who can beat or match seven? Tattoos, anyone? Has anyone got one? You got one? Can you please name one? Uh, I've got happiness comes first, but it's not in that order in another language. Happiness comes first? How is the word come spelled? What a dick, <laughs> if I can say that. It'd be interesting, eh, no bleach. <laughs> Especially now that the kids are calling it changing your ringtone. <laughs> I felt really uncomfortable with a lot of guys, especially older guys, actually all of them, just making a whole lot of masturbation jokes. It was tone deaf. I don't, I'm not virtue signaling. I'm not trying to be high and mighty. It just felt like, you know what? There's so many different topics. So How do you feel about the masturbation? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not my top of here, but I wouldn't do it like that. I think, look, me personally, no. Masturbation is not my focus. <laughs> I'm glad we're all having a chuckle. Why? Because I said the word masturbation. <laughs> but I think sometimes when you appeal to a larger audience, it's not on the same level as it is on a smaller audience. You know, when you're intimate, you can hit on different things. But I think the key is to maybe allude to something along those lines, but without saying the words. Oh, it was a positive, like, just to see uh, in their body language how much they were enjoying it. One thing I, I took out of it was that I need to enjoy it. Like, I, I feel like uh, it's, it's, it's sort of opens an eye opener that um, that's, what I, that's, that's what I need. It gave me a bit of energy. Like. I loved Stevie Sticks. You know, it was just beautifully presented. <laughs> she was self-deprecating, but she was landing little barbs at everyone, touching on privilege a little bit. So there's a bit of social, political subcontext, but carried with a lot of fun. Mm. And the cucumber, my goodness, <laughs> I'm never going to make a salad in the same way. Um, 
when I think about the bigger picture, yes, it's overwhelming. So instead of diving into this deep end of, oh, Saturday and the unknown, instead I'm going to focus on creating a space, timing, uh, connecting to an audience, because I think words are important, but the other stuff is more important. So that's been my focus today. Uh, my big take up is to respect the audience, practice more, polish. Polish, mm. polish, polish. There were some awkward bits tonight, some rough edges, and I just think they didn't have to be there. Next time on Is This How Thing I On, the one. students begin to realise like, just what a like massive undertaking they, they have embarked on, and the uh, first signs everybody of stress begin to creep into the group. I'm a good friend of Eurydice's. Glyn challenges each performer to create and deliver new material, and guest comedian Mayumi Nabetsu takes the class out of their comfort zone with a challenge designed to flex their creative muscle and strengthen their intestinal fortitude. <laughs> oh, jeez.